Okay, team. Let's talk about things. Okay, all right. I know. I'm sorry for the 75 minute interruption, but it has to happen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm paid to do it. That's the only reason I'm here. Um, no, I love it. So that's why I'm here. Um, because I don't think about money properly. Okay, so um, my middle brother. Wow, good. Anyway, so um, seriously, used to sell our stuff to other people. We, we didn't know about it. Um, incredible guy. Uh, so, um, right, I'm going to tell you uh, more about this rich gets richer stuff. Then we're going to have this argument between Simon and Mandelbrot. I think many of you have probably heard of Mandelbrot. Fractal is a very famous character, famous for also being pretty, you know, snarky and um, strong-willed. Uh, Simon, as you, I think, you probably, so who had heard of Herbert Simon? Had you heard of him? Anyone? You ever heard of Herbert Simon before? Yeah, yeah, so there's a list of things for him that's, right, okay. <laughs> um, but he is, you know, in the sort of, right, and we saw his citations, right? I mean, he has impressed other people, should we say. Uh, anyway, so it's, it's always a pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Mandelbrot's out there because he's got the fractal thing. But he did other things. He did a lot of work on finance too, actually. Okay, so uh, things are, I've been upgrading a few pieces. Uh, let's see. Obviously, we have to talk about Pratchett. So this is this morning. Sorry, sorry. It's just such a great cat. See, I'm compiling your um, lectures for the day, like messing with them, basically, because I do that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. He reboots computers frequently, which cats do, right? I mean, he just crawls across things. That video I showed you from Montreal took 30 hours to make, but it also took about 50 because he sat on the computer at some point and just <laughs> rebooted it. What a lovely cat. Anyway, there you go. Very, the helper. Here's some more help from him. He's so great. Um, we love our cat. It's a ridiculous cat. Uh, okay, all right, good, sorry. I was going to show you pictures of otters as well, but Pratchett is good. Just, just as a therapeutic uh, aspect. Okay. Uh, crazy things keep happening in the world. And even though it doesn't always, sh you know, so this, this is Charlottesville, right? And I talked about how this drop was really extreme in terms of what we'd seen in the past. You don't always see uh, overtly big events because there's so many stories happening at once. But, you know, strange things over the weekend. So, for example... Um, so this is, this is for Sunday, this is, so this is, you know, we, we computed on the Monday morning. So this is for all of Sunday, kind of Eastern Standard Time's Sunday, if you like. Uh, but you see respect and disrespect, right? I mean, it's hard, it's hard. you can go onto Twitter, for example, and, and, you know, start reading tweets at your, you know, peril, right? One of our maxims is never read the tweets. Um, but it can be hard to tell, right? What's the balance of things? So you need something or some instrument to read a million tweets or more than that. Uh, and so, you know, we'd have to do more than this, but you see protests, there's a negativity here, there's less of happiness and so on. But, you know, there are two sides to this one and, and they're both being quite vocal. Some of them are butts. Um, but, you know, then there are strange things like this. This is a pretty average looking day, but the top thing here, if you can see this, um, those two words, ain't and bum, that comes from one tweet, which was retweeted a lot more than someone else's tweet. LeBron James, <laughs> you bum. And uh, then he, you know, discussed why he's looking out for his buddy, um, Steph Curry. Very strange. I don't know what's going on, but it's very strange, right? So, you know, like we have to do, we're just trying to measure happiness and then sort of show why things are going up and down. You know, to get the story out, to find that, that's a, you know, to do that in an automated way, that's a harder thing to do, to sort of get it to pop out that, the president said these things and then LeBron James responded and was talking about, right, to, to have that automated, that's a hard thing to do. Oh, yeah, you mean, so that, what's, what's around that word? So what's around ain't, yeah. Yeah, that would be really good. But you don't. No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> that would be really good. I mean, there's interactivity in the sense that you can look at um, the negative pieces, right? And the, so these are the, word, these are the negative words that were pushing this day down relative to the seven days before. So they're going to be a bunch of negative words. These are happy words that were going the other way. These were left, these are negative words that were being used less. 
So that helps, right? These are right, some swearing, there's less about cancer and so on. And these are happy words that were also being used less and that hurts this day, right? So you can either have more negative words, which is that other piece, or less happy words. So these things are down on this day and that's pushing its score down. But it's a, you know, overall it kind of balances out. But there's a texture, you know, you can see textures of these things. Um, right. Yeah, so all this stuff, there's protest, disrespect. So that's going different ways. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, we're getting to... We're getting to find, we're doing some more work now in Charlottesville in terms of looking at information content, which we'll talk about in a little bit, entropy, and uh, we have this thing called Story Finder that we've been building for many years, really, actually. We've had a bit of a lull with it, but you can really see this, what happens actually is a drop in entropy here, which is a drop in surprise, which may seem odd, but it's a drop in information content, and what it means is that people are all talking about the same thing. And then, of course, you look at the words to see what it is. Okay some things. Okay, I'm going to show you that. This visualization will come soon. Um, okay, all right, right. For some reason, we will talk about Highlander today. Highlander fans? Anyone know what Highlander is? Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the great worst movies of all times. Okay, so um, somehow has a Scotsman playing a Spaniard and a Frenchman playing a Scotsman. Mm. Yeah. What's that? They all have. They also have. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we'll talk about that. I will make it relevant because I want to. Uh, okay. So we got to this business back here. So we had the whole um, this rich gets rich model. Super simple. You can simulate it in R or MATLAB or Python, whatever you want to do. Um, I mean, you could sort of do it with, uh, you know, with pencil and paper and sort of start to see things. It's pretty simple. So that's in your assignment right now. We got to this end point where we talked about um, how people have framed this over time, right? So I just want to point this out again. Simons is sort of the big, uh, one, of, one of two big famous papers here, and it has this terrible branding. De Solo Price called a cumulative advantage. You'll hear that said. It's rich get, rich get richer is, is the, what I will use in general. Talked about the Matthew effect. Robert K. Merton will come back in a little bit. He's very famous and appears in lots of things, um, as we saw here. And Barabazi and Albert, and we'll talk about this when we get to networks, which is in three or four weeks' time. Uh, okay, so that's pretty good. So I wanted to say, uh, we had a question about um, projects. I will talk about them soon, and I'll give you a bunch of suggestions, all sorts of things. I know there's some stuff lurking around on the front of the, is it on the website? Or in the, it's on, in the header for the assignment, yeah. Yeah, I was just, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. But the idea is eventually you'll sort of just send me something once a week, which will be an update of a document. That's the idea. So don't worry about that yet. I'll try to get it, you know, it can get delayed. I'll try to get that going as soon as possible. Uh, okay, so it turns out that that analysis that we um, went through that gave us a power law size distribution, and we could think of cities, right? So how many, we take the biggest city, then the next biggest city, the next and so on, and we order them, one, two, three, four, right? And we plot their sizes. And if you put that on a log-log plot, you get this power law tail. Great, okay? And we found out what that exponent was. You can think of it alternatively, right? That's the um, mirror of the complementary uh, CDF, the CCDF, which we've been working on back in power law size distributions. If you look at the frequency distribution, then you get a power law as well, okay? However, it turns out that this model doesn't exactly produce this. And there's um, a reason that, oh, there's a reason that, <laughs> it's super little. there's a reason that uh, Simon's analysis, which is lovely and powerful and very well done, and there are gamma functions and beta functions, you'll get to those, which are um, factorials for grown-ups, uh, is that he found a distribution, and if you have, you know, a Gaussian or an exponential or whatever, and in principle there's sort of an infinite number of things in this distribution, right? If you miss one element, it doesn't matter. However, if that element has a size that stands off of the distribution, for example, so say we have some distribution of sizes, so this is going to be size, um, probability of size, and this is you know, some size thing like this. If we have one thing that has a huge size like this, right? So this is most of the time you get all these things, but there is one of them that's big, right? So if we had this little world, it might be like this. There are all these little guys and there's one big city. There's a monster city. 
It turns out Simon's model actually produces this, right? And, and what uh, Simon, Simon's analysis had done was to just sort of ignore this thing and look at this distribution. This is pretty weird because no one noticed this for 60 years and um, it was only through this, this is this claim, um, through this class and then uh, actually getting to a point where we said, oh, well, let's simulate it. It's an easy thing. So this came out of a, you know, I mean, in math and stats, so I was sort of obliged to make it as mathy as possible to start with. Um, I'm really a physicist. So it evolved so that we have a bit of everything now, right? We have coding and, da -da -da and some data stuff because that's what you should have, to be honest. Um, so eventually I added, uh, well, just simulate the model. And so if you simulate the model, it turns out you start to get the first one is disproportionately large. It doesn't fit, right? So if we do the zip, this is the frequency size distribution. If we do the zip plot, which is the size, this is rank, right? If we do this one, and this is rank, um, and we'll do log 10, and I'll have plots. We'll actually have a little interactive thing. So if we, this is what Simon produced, right? So there's a power law decay, and this is the exponent um, S of R scales like R to the minus alpha. And we actually found that this is R to the minus one minus rho. That's the innovation rate. It's a sad rho. Okay. Um, then in fact, the first one, so this is, you know, this is log 10. So we've got one here, two, da, 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 da. It turns out that this first one is actually here. Depend and there's a, there's a, I'll get, I'll show you what this, well, it's here. I'll, we'll talk about what it is in a second. But it turns out that that first one, gets to grow faster. So this is a, the, the, you know, the wording for this is, um, or the catchphrase for this one is first mover advantage, right? So this is a good business speak kind of thing. And if you redo the analysis, and I'll just kind of go through it quickly to show you some of it, uh, then you get this. So this is the size of the nth arriving group at time t. And you don't have to worry about all this too much, but there's, you know, so this is the innovation rate, right? So the probability that the next uh, entrant is new, as we had before. So it's just a little factor. This is gamma of two minus rho. So it's a gamma function. These are just some numbers at the front. And then these are the crucial pieces, right? So this is uh, scaling as t to the minus one, uh, one minus rho, and then the t to the minus one minus rho. These have the same form. It's just that these numbers don't match up. Uh, so there's a break, really, right? So this is all of one piece. Right? We, can, we can characterize everything, the second, the third, fourth group. We can write down one formula for it. But the first group gets its own special formula. And that's to do that. So it's essentially because the first group is there straight away. The second group arrives roughly at time one over rho. Right? So if there's a 0.1 chance of a new group, then it takes every 10 steps roughly to get a new group. Or if it's 0.01, then it takes about 100. So that first one gets all this time by itself to just reproduce. So it gets a big start. Uh, and and if, you know, if you look at this, gamma of two minus rho, gamma fans out there will know this is roughly, you know, this is close to one, gamma of two. Gamma of two is one. And if rho is close to zero, then this is close to gamma of two. So this is one. So the, and this is going to be one minus rho. Usually the innovation rate is low. So this is a rho to the power of one minus something small. So this is really a one here and a row here. So the difference is a factor of row, right? Other little details, but basically a factor of row. So if you know, there's a 0.001 chance of innovation, then that we expect the first one to be a thousand fold bigger than, than what the theory would predict, that the, the Simon's uh, analysis would predict. I mean, that's a very rich, beautiful paper. It's worth reading. It's ancient, I suppose, but it's beautifully done. But it missed this thing. So this is a big piece, yes. So rho is, you said the innovation rate. What sort of conceptually is gamma described? Oh yeah, so gamma here is, um, so you will, this is part of the assignment, right? If you haven't seen gamma functions, this is a thing you will learn, but. Um, <laughs> beautiful things. So the gamma function all this stuff that Sterling's approximation piece will be there. So um, there it is. Uh, it's a funny looking beast, but it's basically, so here's, it's an odd thing. Here's the, it looks, it'll look odd. That's what it is. So gamma of z is this object, right? 
Um, and what it is, if you put in uh, an integer, a positive integer here, right? So if we put in um, 0, 1, 2, right? We put in these things. And you compute this, then you get uh, n factorial. So if this is gamma, of, if we put z equals n plus 1, you get, you get n factorial comes out. So this is, so think of the fact, the factorial is a function of the integers. Um, and this is the analytic continuation of it, is the technical term. So it means that we can have gamma of, we can have a factorial of a half, three quarters complex numbers because mathematicians are crazy. That's what we do, right? So you say, okay. But it turns out that this thing appears a lot, actually, and there are good reasons for, for using it. It pops up all over the place. Yeah. And in fact, the normalization, that root pi in the, in the Gaussian distribution, one over two root, root two pi at the front is from gamma of a half, which is nice. Yeah. So it's so like uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so it's a sort of a, it, it, the idea is that, you know, you can have a function of integers, you have functions of real numbers, and that they, there actually is a, that that is in fact a, a slender part of a bigger function, a function that operates on a bigger space, should I say. Yeah, that collapses down. And we, we typically think of analytic continuation as going a function of the real numbers to be a function of the complex numbers, but actually this is sort of integers. Yeah. So it's, it's just a number, right? So gamma of a half is root pi. They have certain numbers. They're just, they're numbers, and you can compute them. So this is a, a constant. And uh, it, it satisfies this recursion relation. Let me, let me put on this because I think that's fun. Um, it, it's odd that it looks, it may seem odd because it's an analytic thing, but if you, so gamma of uh, x plus one equals x gamma of x. It has this recursion relation, right? So you can, there's, a diff, there's a difference of one here, this plus one going this way. And so if you, and we, if you want, you can compute gamma of one, and that's um, one. So from that, you can build out, right? So gamma of two uh, is one times gamma of one using that recursion relation, so that's one. And gamma of three is two times gamma of uh, two, so that's two times one. And then in general, gamma of n plus one is n times gamma of n. So it has the structure that factorials have, and that keeps going. So n, and that n times n minus 1 down to 1, that's n factorial. Very good. Very nutritious. You will enjoy it. Um, there's plenty of help for you for that, and I'm happy to talk about it. Okay. More than happy. Okay. All right, so this is... Um, <coughs> I mean, I, it's kind of an odd thing. I realized that, th that in fact, the solution wasn't right, and I spent 15 hours one Sunday writing crazy things to myself and eventually got this out, and it works. Um, we published this last year, and there was a bunch of people, actually, and uh, a lot of, lot of Puck students were involved because it was a nice thing. So here are plots. Here are these, uh, uh, these are, so this is the number, the group number, when it arrives, right? So the first one, second one, this is log 10 of it, so the first one is here. And this is the, this, these are their sizes. And this is averaged over many things. You can kind of see it. See, there's a sort of a gray blob around here. That's a, a suggestion of how much variation there is. Because it is a stochastic thing. The equation I just showed you on the previous page have exact results, but um, I, I'm talking about the average behavior. Uh, but there is some, of course, variation. We'll get to that in a second. So this is the zip plot, right? This is ordered by size. This is the frequency size distribution. So it's again a power law. Here's the size. This is the prob if you were sampling from it, here's the probability. This is a power law size distribution. But it has this one sitting off here. Right? There's a big one. Right? So this is all looks good for a power law. And then there's a big one over here. Right? And if we did the complementary cumulative and turn it around, we get this plot. That's the connection between zip and frequency distributions. So this is for rho equals 0 0.1, 0 0.01, uh, 0 0.001, and then one more order of magnitude. So, as I said before, it's always it's a factor of one over rho, so that's a 10 here, a 100, a 1,000, and then 10,000. And this is then a little plot of some of them, right? So this is 
uh, at some point in the evolution of it, here's the biggest one, and then the next biggest, right? And then for the 0.01 probability of a new uh, entrant, it looks like this. And so, you know, if, you, if Simon had simulated it, you would see that this is kind of, there's a first mover advantage. This is kind of big, right? Yeah. Um, but everyone was totally happy with this because it was some nice math, and Simon's incredibly smart, and um, uh, so it almost worked. So there's a little visualization I wanted to show you. So Fletcher Hazelhurst, who uh, is a total hero, and it is back here. Yeah, so, th so you come to this, this is a, we have these online appendices because we've tried to, you know, papers or old PDFs these days, but we, they, a lot of them should be apps, right? They should be app-like, actually. So we have our hilarious joke that we have app indices um, from many of our papers. And so you, you come to it, and it has a little set of instructions. Uh, Fletcher graduated last two years ago. He was captain of the cross-country team. Great kid. Um, knew how to suffer, essentially. So that's what happened when he made this. Uh, so you can, you can do these things. Right? Da, 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 da. So can I just get through? OK, lots of instructions. Oh, and you can make it faster. So cool. Um, OK. So it should be good. So we play, right? So there's a little simulation here. And so if you restart it, this is for 0.01. And so the zip floor is being plotted dynamically out there. And it should resize itself. It's pretty obvious there's a big character here. So this is Simon's model. This is a simulation of Simon's model with the pictures. Um, using D3, it's kind of great. And he actually has the total number in there. So. You know, this is one of these things where you do the math, it's all fun, and you da, 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 but it's always good to simulate things. Um, much less, you know, compare it to the real world. Which, as we know, Simon did, and, and did pretty well. It's just that there was a, it doesn't, there is a problem with this first mover. Okay, so, you know, if we did something like, uh, you know, oh, like this one, right, so then totally dominates. Right? There are a few little Squeakers on the outside here, um, but they are very sad little friendless things. Okay, and I think that actually, that finished, right? That, but if we get to something like 0.5, then, then you start to have the possibility that the first one doesn't, um, the first one doesn't win necessarily, right? It becomes much more stochastic. Yeah. And you don't see the first mover advantage. Ooh, that's sadly going to take a long time. Can I do that? Whoop. This might kill the browser and my machine. So this is dangerous, dangerous. Stop. OK. OK. Pretty cool, right? So um, and it tells the story pretty straight away, right? So boom, good. We're good. OK, so well done, Fletcher. That was a great paper. Um, really enjoyable. OK, so if you want to I'll just quickly say this. If you go through the way Simon did it, which is the plan for you guys, um, there's an alternate way to do it, which is just to say, what's the size of the... Because that was grouping things together. It was talking about, um, let's count the number of groups that have K members and let, look at how they change, right? That was the framing. N sub K comma T. I fixed that error to the typo. Um, the N1 thing. The N1, I'm just complying. I'm just saying I fixed that error on the slides. Um, but that was NKT, right? That was the number of groups that had size K. So that's a good thing to look at. This is now looking at it from the Zips law story. It's like, what's the first group size expected to be after T time steps? What's the 17th group? You know, what's the 45th one? Uh, and of course, the, they don't appear, right? So the 45th one has to appear at some point, And it will typically take 1 over rho times 45, right? Because only 1 over rho Rows are probably that you get a new group. So again, if it's 0.01, then we expect like every 100 time steps, roughly, we will get a new group. So we'd have to wait 4,500 time steps to get the 45th group to appear and start to grow. So huge first mover aspect, right? This is a real Ponzi scheme, bad situation for the ones who come later. They're in trouble, which is capitalism, right? So, um, OK. so. Uh, this is easy. We do this thing where we drop the, uh, the thingamajigs, right? And uh, the, the, this average. And we're just going to rearrange things. This is just some algebra. This is the t, the, the size of the nth group at time t. It's going to look like it's going to be a little bit of a growth, right? So it's going to look ma mainly like this is 1 times it. 
And then this is a small number, right? T becomes large eventually. The one minus rho is between zero and one. So there's always just this little, on average, growth of it. Um, you know, you can really dig into this if you're insane, we did that. Uh, and it, when it starts, it just has one entry, right? So you can play around with this. You can say, well, what if a group turns up and it has three members? That helps a lot, actually, right? So if you just have one member to start with, and this is actually because of that random walk thing, it's related to that. The expected time to reproduce for a group that comes later in the system is infinite, right? So this is really a bad Ponzi scheme. You join the team, you're the thousandth team to, to you join your thousandth group to appear, your expected time to get a new friend is infinity. Once you get one, if you're one of the lucky ones, then, you know, then you're kind of off. You'll grow a bit faster than everyone else. Um, some math, you don't have to worry about this, but basically you just sort of play this out. We have the relationship with the t and the t minus one one, and we just da, 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 da. Uh, This will look similar to what you have to do in your um, assignment right now. You can just sort of expand this out, right? So there's a t minus one here. We're going to put it up there. Put, you know, we're just collecting these fractions properly. And then you start to see a pattern, right? There's t minus one, t minus two, dot, dot, dot. That looks like a factorial. This also looks a bit like a factorial, but you have to clean it up. There's some help for, the, for that in the assignment. So these are sort of... You know, as I said, factorials on drugs. And um, these are beta functions, which are really um, ratios of three factorials. So uh, there's, a, there's a, this nice solution for it. And we look at the asymptotic behavior for large T of these things. I'm just flashing this up. Don't have to worry too much. Uh, and then we see that um, <coughs> we have this difference between them, right? This was for the first group, the second group. It didn't really matter which group it was. The big difference is that the initial time that a group arrives looks like this, right? So this is the um, a, a, a rounding of n minus 1 divided by rho. So the second group, for example, arrives at roughly 1 over rho time steps. As we said before, right, the 45th one will be 45 minus 1, so da da da. But the first group arrives at time 1. It doesn't have, so the first group would be 0 over rho. That, that doesn't work. So it, it seems like a slightly sort of weird technical thing, but it's, as we saw from that visualization, it's real, right? The first one grows like a champion. Um, so Simon missed this one by working on the size distribution. We're working, we're, we're working straight on the zip distribution as it emerges. So we get that first one's growth. Um, as I showed you before, right? The size frequency distribution had this extra character out here. But so Simon got that part of the distribution perfectly. There's just this one out of, in principle, infinity of uh, you know, members in this ensemble, so didn't miss anything. If you normalize it, da -da -da, it's all good. Um, okay. Okay, this is fine. So it doesn't really apply to the Barbara's yell, but that's for later on, which is the network growing one, because there's always innovation. There's always a new member. Don't worry about that. We'll get to that. Um, <coughs> this is uh, something I just said before. You don't have to worry about this either, but this is a probably that uh, given that uh, a node, a, a group, the, the nth group has size k. This is probably that after tau more steps, it gets one more friend. And you can go through and compute. This is a different calculation. It has this kind of form. There's tau to the minus this blob up here. So uh, if k equals 1, and t is very large, so it dominates this thing, then you start to see this is a power law size distribution that has an exponent between 1 and 2. So it's like the random walk one. The first return one, between one and two, means it's normalizable, but it has infinite mean. So that's exactly the disastrous problem. Once you get two friends, once you have two friends in your group, then you should reproduce, right? There's an average time to reproduction after that. But it's a bad, bad game to join just by yourself. Which, you know. So, you know, these models, you know, the mathematical models, they're hard, strong models, right? So you can really, you hear the ingredients, here's exactly the form that comes out even if it takes 60 years to clean it up. Um, and, and that's incredibly useful, right? The, I mean, it may seem like a toy model, and it does have these pretty good, I mean, it is a kind of toy model, but it has pretty good agreement with real world data, which is surprising. Uh, and it's very easy to understand the ingredients and the process and so on. And you really have this bedrock thing. We're not just arguing about sort of rich gets richer and people get in front. We have this, so you know, over and over again, we need these kinds of, um, Beautiful, clear, simple models that tell us stories that we can then think about um, in the real world. And of course, sometimes we want to model the whole thing. I'll get, maybe I'll say this later on, but Thomas Schelling, we'll come to him once at a conference that we invited him to. He pointed out that um, 
It was actually from a friend of his, right? So in fluid dynamics models, you have the flow around something very simple, like a ball, right, or, or a circle in 2D, and you can solve for it analytically and do all this sort of work, right, and really get it all out. You know, it's an obvious Stokes equation, it's a horrible thing, but, you know, people do all this hard work to get it out analytically and do simulations, but you don't then sort of slowly deform that ball into a plane, right? Like you, so there isn't necessarily this kind of in-between thing where you slowly go from this beautiful sort of story here where you understand something really well to gradually produce something that's real and, and matters in that sense. So um, you're often dealing with these complex things by getting these simple models to work and then whole hog sort of stuff out there. We'll see that with spreading and diseases as well. Same thing. Yeah, I think it's a good story. Okay, so there are other works on this and I'll just have them here. Um, Mark Newman, who's a total hero. Sid Redner, champion at Santa Fe Institute. They've done similar, some other aspects, but no one had noticed the first one. All right, I just want to mention them. Okay, so two more slides on this. So it's actually, a, it's a random stochastic thing, right? So this is one simulation and this is the nth group here. So this would be the normal Zipf's law. This is the nth group. Uh, this is for, I think, um, roughly 0.01 for the innovation rate. And this is, I call these kind of jellyfish type plots, right? There's a little bit of jelly blob behind. Ah, they're not jellyfish plots, they're gel plots. They're little blobs here, okay? So um, th these ones in black here are the actual sizes of the first group, the second group, the third group. So the first group wins, right? It, is, it does have that first mover advantage. There's always a chance, even in you know, a low innovation rate, that the, the first group appears you know, there's a one in a thousand chance rate, right? Maybe the, the next one is different. And then you've got a battle, right? It could be that the second one, but, but much of the time you will see, you know, the first one win for a long time and then, you know, no one will, the second group will never beat it. It will never get in front. But there's a lot more jumbling later on. And we'll get to this later on with success in this, this thing called Music Lab, right? That one wins, but later on, these are, these are the group sizes, right? So this is a measure of a success. So if you're the thousandth one, you know, you could have one member in it later on. There are a bunch down here that have one member. It looks like everyone who was in the first hundred groups, they did okay, right? They started to reproduce. But now you have ones that are singletons. But some, of, some in that, you know, between a hundred and a thousand, this is log 10, uh, did quite well, right? So there's a lot of variation here. So this is, so I saw, we saw, I mentioned John Cleese the other day. Um, so I went to see him. He had, they, they showed the um, Holy Grail and then he spoke for an hour, you know, in this interview thing. And he, he, he can go off, but it, it was pretty... But he did actually get to this point. He said he realized after all this time seeing other people in show business that a lot of it was about luck, right? And it's, this is not... People don't like this. They don't like this. But it's a lot about luck. And then, then the question is, do you have to show up over and over again? Which is Woody Allen's story, right? But you just keep trying. But there is a lot of uh, luck involved. So. That sort of is manifestly in this piece. Now the blue one is the reordering, right? So if we take this result and then we order them by size, which is what we do when we make diff ZIF distributions, then it all looks really nice and clean and it actually fits the analytic result. But this one example, this is one run, I'm not averaging over many, this is one run, shows the horribleness that's sort of been lost in all these analyses we've done. Um, this is then another version of, this is the, the rank of a group and this is when it arrived, right? So this is the 100th group, the 10th group, many, many simulations now. And this is then their rank. So this is another way of looking at success. And there are, what, two orders of magnitude here? Am I getting that right? So maybe, yeah, two orders of magnitude here in rank. And that seems to be kind of stable. After that first one, right, the first group wins over and over, right? This is their rank. They're the first group arriving and they turn out to be you know, now and then they might lose, but generally they are always there, so you don't see anything around it. These are quartiles. This is the median in here. This is a 95% confidence interval or sort of range. So huge variation in where they could come out, right? So you're the hundredth group, but there's a two order, two magnitudes, um, two orders of magnitude range in, in your final ranking potentially, which is pretty horrific. Uh, if you take this little piece in here and then sort of collapse all that data, you see this. This is a, this is your, you know, um, final. This is a measure. This is a probability of where you are in your final ranking, kind of renormalized. And there are two orders of magnitude there, as well. Um, there's some other stuff there, but that's a, 
Let's just show you there's a lot of randomness underneath all of this too, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, last one. So this is a ridiculous uh, self-referential kind of thing, but this is, okay, so we should be able to go and look at this in real data, right? Is that we've got this mechanic that has been, you know, suggested at work for things like Ulysses, we'll see it for, right? So you've got really different things like, you, um, um, you know, the, the, the text Ulysses and something like the Linux kernel, the Debian Linux kernel. I mean, these are very different objects and the early growth of the web, very different things. They all seem to have Simon-like behavior in the mechanism is actually playing out like that. This is data for, from citation data and this is from the original paper that we'll get to later on uh, by Barabasi and Albert, I mentioned it. So scale-free networks, right? So they introduced this mechanism of net growing networks. They call it scale-free networks. It was, it sort of lacked in a few ways, but it was a, uh, you know, a version of Simon's model, sort of. Um, ooh, we'll get to something in a second. Okay, so uh, this is then taking, looking at all papers that come after, after that paper, which was in 1999, it was published in 99, and finding ones that have in their title um, scale-free networks. So we really want um, papers that are really talking about this, right? It could be in the abstract, it could be in the text, they could just cite the paper. I mean, the paper's been cited, I don't know, what it is, 35, 40,000 times now. But this is trying to say, uh, you know, here's this new field of real specific area of research and it's been framed in a certain way and these people are really talking about it, right? They're really analyzing it. Uh, and so you see, this is the original paper's number of citations, right? You can see it's uh, some multiple of 10 to the 4, right? So multiple of 10,000. Uh, and then this is a best line of fit. It's going to be pretty messy because we only have this one realization of the world. Uh, you see that, you know, this is an early one that didn't get cited very well. Some of these down here haven't been cited very well. And, and then a lot of jumping around. We gave everyone a plus one as well, which is the solar prices thing. If you hadn't been cited, right, so everyone gets a plus one. Um, anyway, so if you do that fit and you project it back to here, there's a factor of 10. And that fits with the innovation rate being estimated from this of being about 0.1 as well. So this is one example where Right, the innovation rate is 0.1, and then a 10 here, not bad. This paper is about Simon's model, essentially, right? So it's self-referential in that sense. Okay, all right, all right, okay, crazy. Totally crazy, okay, all right, all right, all right. So let's talk about Mandelbrot. We okay with that? Mandelbrot, okay. So Mandelbrot came with fractals, uh, would always point out to you that his name meant almond bread, if he had to talk about it. Um, I'm sure you've seen this thing, but you know, where is it? Let's, let's get Mandelbrot's, it's just a wiki. It's a GIF, right? People love this thing. It gave uh, mathematicians hope in the 80s that they could recruit people because they had beautiful pictures so here's an interesting thing, right? There's a little, there's a little, you know, this is an analysis of a property of a mathematical iterate, but um, it's not a physical thing. And there are lots of, of course, there are uh, Mandelbrot's, see, there it is inside itself. Mandelbrot's great observation was that, and this is how he framed it, right? That nature is full of fractals. That the, the geometry of nature is fractal, which is his word. So these self-similar structures. So again, it's a scaling thing. Oh my God. This is a GIF too. Has it reproduced? Has it started again? Pretty good GIF action. Oh, there we go. It started to fall apart at the end. Um, it's like going too far in Minecraft. It starts to like. Yeah, it's a solid. Oh, does it say that? Oh, 475. There you go. Thank you. Yep. GIF. Ha ha ha. Sorry. I'm from, the, from a long time ago. Um, it really was, that's what people said. And uh, even the, the guy who came up with them <laughs> said, I call him Jif, and everyone's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that's great for you, buddy. Um, obviously, it's GIF. <sighs> that hurts. Okay. Um, uh, Mandelbrot, so lots of things I mentioned. They worked on financial time series again with that kind of fractal story because they have this brand in motion things. Um, 
and he did some work on 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 this uh, zip floor story as well. And so his paper, as I said ages ago, I think it feels like now, was published just before a um, couple of years before Simon. So he has a totally different idea. Simon's model is this random growth thing, right? There's just random, you know, you're big and then it's just, uh, someone copies you, you know, just get copied. You just mindless copying, you just go and run into the system, grab the nearest one and say, I'll, I'll do what you do, right? Um, I will move to the, a city of a random human in the US. Good. Unless, you know, you want to start a new one. And then as we showed, you will have very little likelihood of friends um, joining you. Uh, okay, candy water, good. So, um, you know, so this is, this is a little bit more like what Zip was talking about. Zip had no mechanism or mathematical structure, but said, okay, there's some balance. You wanna, you wanna get information across uh, and you wanna have as little cost as possible. And we've talked about how language has evolved over time, over now thousands of years, and has actually become a more cleaner code and in fact, one of the big things that's happened is a lot of um, you know, structure and say conjugations and all these kind of florid bits that would hang off words to indicate, you know, so the word, verb, I'm making this up, the verb jump over, you say, you know, the pig jumped over the fence, but the word jump would have inside it pig and fence, you know, like it would actually have these things added to it to tell you that the pig was a female or a male or had four hooves, you know, like this is sort of how it used to be. And then we started to think, well, you don't need to have that, right? Because if you listen to it, I mean, accidentally, and with humans just talking to each other, right? It's a social constructed thing. Um, you need the context around words to understand you know, what they mean. So we, we started to throw things away and not have so much structure. Okay, so uh, anyway, but this is, this is a reasonable thing. Okay, yeah. It's not obvious why that would mean that we would have some words that we have a lot of, like the and of and an. I mean, they are ridiculously common. The is about 4% of all words in English written down or said, which is kind of odd. Has anyone looked at why the structure has appeared in the first place? Why not just go straight to more simple? To look at older languages? You yeah, mean like in, why, why is it that language started evolving with the standard? Oh, okay, so there's... Or that we're just now getting rid of them? There, we want to admit but there are origin of language models as well and efforts to understand that. That's a whole other thing. There are some pretty interesting, oh, I should write that down, there's some um, pretty interesting things on how you can see phoneme spreading, all sorts of stuff, yeah, yeah. over time, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I mentioned this, there's a really weird one is that uh, the higher up in elevation that a language sort of originated from and you know, where the people were, the more consonant, more consonants you have, because it's colder. <laughs> you keep your mouth closed more, and then when it's hotter, you can like. Then, apparently, this is true. That's a pretty weird one. There are lots of weird things. Lots of weird things. Language is magnificent. It's great. What's that? Ah. <sighs> Yeah, but accents keep coming, right? Michigan, Michigan's growing an accent more, right? It's actually like separating itself more. I don't know. It's very interesting. I mean, a lot of the, you know, you have to have separation of people, right? For that, to, like they really have to, you know, so England produced all of this variation. Australia really never had quite the variation. Like the US does because you had different language bases coming in as well. Um, Hmm. I mean, we could talk about this forever. Uh, and I could just make, we could all just make things up too, which is fun. Um, uh, you know, somewhere like Papua New Guinea, right? You, you, right, you go into the next valley, different language, because mm, kind of a rough situation you get, right? We're not, we're not friends. So you get incredible diversity of language there, um, which is being lost, right? So there's that as well. Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, some, w this will get us to a very important thing in, in just in systems in general, which is measuring information. Um, and there's a character behind that that, again, probably no one has ever heard of. There's actually a nice book on this. So um, 
Claude Shannon. A few people have heard of Shannon, right? So Shannon's entropy is the famous thing. Uh, basically started information theory, working at Bell Labs. And uh, there's actually a uh, biography of him that's just come out, and it sort of has that framing, like no one's ever talked about this guy. You know, like everyone writes about Einstein and Newton and all these other people, but um, information is sort of a big deal. It's a bit of a funny framing too, because information to us sounds like meaningfulness as well, but it's not about that. So we have to be careful with that. Um, okay, <laughs> of course we have schools of information, we have all sorts of things. So the idea is somehow there's some cost in speaking, and that could be just the total you know, time it takes for you to say something. So it could be just sort of adding up the length of words, and that's Mandelbrot's simple assumption here. Uh, and then information, you have to think about how we should measure this, right? And so the idea would be, if we had measures for these things, when we try to maximize, you know, and you can imagine over time, a, a language is appearing, and there's some evolution, and you are trying to do things more efficiently, and it would you know, roughly start to move towards a more efficient way of speaking. That's a you know, presumption. Um, Fletcher Hazelhurst, who I mentioned uh, before, we've worked that we'll really be able to finish in January due to some licensing issues with the historical thesaurus. So the, uh, it's based at the University of Glasgow, but it's the OED, right? So the Oxford English Dictionary. There's a historical thesaurus, so it goes back to Old English. 800s, 900s, and then has, um, yeah, the, the evolving thesaurus, right? So which words are connected to which words as, uh, through, as a function of year even. So you can see that the expansion of language to cover more new areas. It was a lot about farming early on, and then grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And there's a, the dominant one now is leisure in terms of things, of words we have to cover it. Leisure. Leisure. <laughs> if I may use the correct term. Um, <laughs> I could do a whole class like that if you want. Or I could do one like this, which is uh, the real Australian accent. Um, where I come from, at least. Anyway, uh, very slow. Would probably take five times as long. Um, sorry. Is that all right? Did I communicate it? Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, what a word. Uh, so, right, so well done humans. Now we talk about having fun, right? And it's sort of odd to see that. But what we're trying to get to with that work eventually is metaphor, because all of this is scaffolding of, of human knowledge, right? How do we talk, how do we think about things? Uh, and this is George Lakoff's point, which apparently no one noticed until 30 years ago, which is that metaphors are how we actually represent the world, right? So we use a lot of spatial metaphors. Look at where we are now with, um, and we do we make mistakes actually, right? So politics is left and right now. That was a spatial metaphor trap waiting for us to fall into it, and we're totally in the box now, and and we struggle now. And sometimes someone will say, well, there's an, you know we could have economics and social. There could be two dimensions, and everyone's like, that's too hard. <laughs> that's too hard. <laughs> you know, like you know, let alone three dimensions. I mean, at least you can put it on a page, but. Um, uh, it's very, it's two dimensional and people now think like that, but it's from the French parliament. At some point they just said the ones over there and the ones, the ones on the left and the ones on the right and they're like, that's easier. Instead of the green hats and the ones with these complicated policies, they're over there. <laughs> right, I mean, that would be much better, you know. And then we have all the beauty of the left, right, sinistral, right, from the, the, the sinister, sinistral is the left side and sinister being bad and you know, like people being taught to you know write with their right hand because this is evil, um, <laughs> and right means right. So it's a it's just not, not good framing. But we we're in that box now with this this two dimensional thing. It's wrong. It's just stupid. <laughs> so you get libertarians running around being libertarians, and then they're like, but you're with the right. You know, like then they're like, no, we're not. You know, so, but there's only this one dimension. You know, it's very stupid. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, the point is metaphors are unbelievably important things and we don't even have a way of like counting them in a text or like identifying. There's a lot of spatial ones, as I said, but it's spatial, very simple kinds of things. You know, you go forward in time, we, you know, we spatialize time. Um, and then there are, you know, sensory ones, right? 
Um, you know, like that idea stinks. You know, it's a just, right? Um, so we have a bunch of them. What's the, what's the problem? And then we scaffold up. We scaffold up. You know, we use old structures to represent new ones. And, yeah. Great project. I would love to get that done. Okay, so, but there is, that's, connect, that's this uh, OED thing. Okay, sorry. Language is great. Yes, um, Lara. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I, I mean, I don't know if anyone's got gotten something to produce a language that works, you know, with a bot, right? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't heard of that. Elon Musk doing good things for the world. Our oh man Zuck. Uh, I think when AI starts to tell stories about itself, that will be a pretty interesting transition. Stories are the big deal. And when that happens, we'll be in an interesting place. Um, I don't know about language. Language creation by humans is a huge enterprise, actually. Lots of people, it seems a bit niche, I suppose, but say, you know, um, what is it, Dothraki, the right Game of Thrones thing. Right? That's made up, of course. I mean, there was some stuff done by, what's his name, G, uh, George R. R. Martin, right? So he, he may put a few words in there, and then someone else comes along and gets uh, actually enlisted by HBO to create, create a language which they do for fun, right? So they, yeah, they do these things. And so they create a whole language, but, and they had to have these pegs of ones that existed. So they create a whole thing. So people do this all the time. And I don't know how they, they think, they must think about, you know, what exists naturally, what would, you know, right? Yeah. Apparently the new Star Trek thing, you can, you can get the subtitles in Klingon. <laughs> 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 Humanity. Um, because <laughs> Because some people will want that, right? Esperanto, Esperanto was the, this, this uh, effort to create a language that everyone would use and there'll be no more war and badness. And I had a student here who'd learnt it for no reason at all, just learnt Esperanto in their spare time. They're like, I know Esperanto. I'm like, okay, wow. Um, you know, they go to uh, conferences. Yeah. <laughs> you want to meet people to speak your language. Yeah, I think many more people know Klingon than Esperanto. And actually, I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think they might. I'm sure Dothraki is getting up there. Wow. Uh, it's our great social invention, right? Uh, there are two, two things in my mind is language and money, right? So money is encoding of belief when it's done properly. Trust, credit card. A credit card literally says this is my belief card, right? Credit is to believe. So um, trust, we have these words built in there. Money doesn't quite, you know, money is an abstract word to us, but it is a, an encoding of belief. Now, who knows what's going on with it now, but, uh, you know, it was a way of saying, you know, I believe in this thing. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so, um, yeah. yeah, that's all in this bit, right? If everyone stops believing in that, then not so good. Yeah, and it goes wrong, right? It goes wrong in places. Okay, so this is a big deal. You know, what's the, what's the balance of like uh, randomness and then optimization, inevitability, universality? You know, you could argue, for example, that fish are shaped in their wet, in the ways they are because of fluid mechanics, and fluid mechanics is universal. It's just true, right? If you have things that live in liquids, they will end up being pointy, generally. You know, and be able to move like that. Of course, you'll get some other weird objects like seahorses and things that aren't very fast, but. Um, uh, okay, so Man of Brian Foster Song. Okay, I mentioned the, the, this thing. <laughs> so uh, uh, they had a bit of a fight, and we'll get to that. So this is pretty great. So there should be only one of many things, like theory, uh, once we've sorted it out. Also Highlander films. Unfortunately, there, were a sec there was a second and a third one um, <laughs> when it was patently clear that it was impossible to have a second one after the first one. So they, um, they made them into being aliens. I mean, it's just all sorts of stuff. But the, the, the premise of this is that for some reason there are a few people flooding around the world that are potentially immortal and they have to kill each other until there's one left and then that person's a good person, I think. And they could help the world, maybe. Anyway, the big deal about this movie is, um, well, it gets used as a motif a lot, right? What's that? I think it was just about power. He's sort of a good guy. Um, 
The great thing about this is uh, Queen's It's a Kind of Magic is uh, the dominant soundtrack for this thing. So really fantastic. I had the cassette. Uh-huh. Okay. So you, you could watch that later on. It's just a shock. Um, uh, but as I said, we have, you know, a Frenchman playing a, a Scot and all these sorts of other problems in it. Um, it's pretty great. And the swords. I don't know what's going on. They have to have swords for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Okay, so the, this is this is this fight, and I'm going to frame it in that way. So we have, as I said, the pap the paper. It's just a chapter within a book, actually, by Mandelbrot. Uh, and I mean, this is pretty good. Uh, informational theory of the statistical structure of languages. Okay, tells you what's going on. This does not really um, get you very excited. And of course, Simon was writing about five things. Right, he had the uh, number of species per genus, the city sizes, um, and words, right? So he had language and he had a couple other pieces. I can't think of them right now. Uh, so then a few years later, we have Mandelbrot pu publishes this thing, and it's a note on a class of skewed distribution functions, analysis and critique of a paper by H.A. Simon, right? So he calls him out, uses the words. Doesn't quite say you bum, but the, you know, this is the earlier version of that because we're writing papers instead of tweets. Um, <laughs> Some further notes, this is Simon, so sort of trying to take the high road, some further notes on a class of skew distribution functions, obviously responding, but not really saying explicitly. Mandelbrot, this is Mandelbrot. Um, these are lines, by the way, from, <laughs> from, from uh, the Queen song, right? Um, it's a great, great song. So uh, f final note on a class of skew distribution functions, analysis and critique of a model due to H.A. Simon. The tweet version of this would be great. Um, <laughs> reply to a final note by ben, Benoit Mandelbrot. Uh, postscriptum to a final note, and then reply. And this is the first where he's like, well, he, he started to use his name here by that guy, you know, who keeps like driving me nuts. Um, it's interesting. Barabasi has a book now where this is laid out in this way, which is interesting. I've been carrying this around for a long time. Um, so here's the sort of, yeah, the, the, the music, the lyrics are primo. So um, we were restating in detail our 59 objections to Simon's model. And now he's got a Pareto Yule Zip, right? Everyone's in this team. I, haven't, I mentioned Pareto a long time ago. Um, most of Simon's reply was irrelevant. Uh, like his early objections, these are invalid, right? So they're having a bit of a go at each other. Plankton, there you go. So this is the sort of, this is from when my children were small. Um, one of the great villains of, of, um, uh, that's ever been put onto a small screen. Okay, uh, this is, uh, I can't play these things properly anymore, but that's, um, what's this? It's a great product of Australia, you're welcome. Does anyone know? Mad Max 3, yes. So this was the story, right? Um, Thunderdome. Not the greatest movie, but Mad Max 4, outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. I mean, if movies were just invented for that one movie, yeah. worth it, yeah. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Three, the Tina Turner, they're trying to make it, it's like, they got some money, yeah. Uh, also, um, Mel Gibson, you're also welcome. Um, but he was born in, he was born in, where was he born? Upstate New York, actually. He's, uh, he's, his family is American. And they moved to Australia. I'm not sure why, but when he was young, something bad happened. And then, uh, and then we, 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 we um, made him who he was. So we gave him the... I mean, he went through Australia's top you know, acting school and everything. How am I doing for time? Uh, yeah, you can watch that one. So, uh, yeah, what a great film. That was unbelievable. Really legit. Yeah. Did not know I existed until... Like some break after about 30 minutes. I'm like, wow. Ah, so great. Anyway. Um, all right. Josh Bungard, you know Dr. Bungard, right? So he spent a long time before that showing his wife the other ones so she, we could go. <laughs> we must see this. Um, of course, Canada has Trailer Park Boys. So that's what they've produced. Okay. Which I can must recommend. <laughs> um, so... All right, so let's set up Mandelbrot's thing. Uh, it's a different business. Uh, he's going to say there are, let's say we have a bunch of words. That's it. 
And, and he's going to really break it into, into letters, which is a bit odd. So uh, the ith word was going to appear with this probably pi, so we're you know, going straight at this distribution idea. Um, words are going to appear randomly. I'm going to produce a little bit more about entropy for you, I think, for the next class. But um, here, I'm, we'll just set this up. Oh, well, you don't work and then you do. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be a funny piece where he says uh, words are going to be, you know, they're made of letters. So that's a, that's a, obviously not true of all languages, but that's a, a key thing here. If you read Glick's, Glick's book on information, he talks about the origin of the alphabet, right, in Mesopotamia. And that, then it just spread, actually. There's sort of this one creation of the alphabet. And then it's spreads everywhere. Um, it was emulated later, later on, like Korean, for example, just made, made theirs, theirs up at some point. Uh, so, uh, okay, yeah, M letters. And words are ordered by, by length. So he's going to just say that the shortest words will be the most commonly used ones. Like, this is a very efficient language. Right? And so the, an odd thing will be that there will be, if we say had 26 letters, we'll have 26 one-letter words, which we don't. Um, and there'll be 26 times 26 two-letter words. Um, that's not quite right, is it? 26 times 25, yeah. Right, yep. Um, and Scrabble fans know, depending on the dictionary you use, how many two-letter words are typically acceptable. Right, instead of like 600 and, what do I say, 10. Well, 25 times 24, if I got that right. I didn't get that right. <laughs> it's about a hundred, right? It's about a hundred. It depends how sketchy it gets, like za for pizza. So wrong. <laughs> and ki as in chi, you know, qi, which is just a, sh just a, just wrong. Okay. Ar is good, which is Hawaiian lava, AA. What's it? On a, ch on a what? A chi? Yeah, well, Let's talk about our Scrabble badness. What? Oh, right, right. <laughs> I see. Sorry. Yeah, it does change the game a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, X always, was always good, right? Because you've got C, XI, XU, which is a Vietnam currency, right? There's all sorts of bad stuff you can do with it. Ox and accent. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> words are going to be ordered. All right, so this is obviously wrong, but... Uh, that's not, that's never stopped uh, anyone before. Of course, all models are wrong, right? That's a famous observation of models. Some are really pretty good though. Okay, so it's a bit of a sketchy thing to say. Uh, right, so we're gonna have a length of word plus a space. That's gonna be our word cost. So let's set up this. Uh, word length didn't matter for Simon's thing. It was obviously much more general. Real words don't use all letters. Yep. Maybe real words roughly follow this pattern. So that's, you know, interesting to look at. I mean, how many three-letter words are there? How many four or five, like in actual fact? Um, it's interesting, actually, when you get to one grams, two grams, three grams, you think about words, right? So lots of words, then two grams, like what are the ones that we actually use in real text? And three grams are really fertile kind of things. Like you put three words together, and this is often what people say for passwords now, right? Three words gives you a lot. There's also the... You can, get a, you can make a lot of meaningful structures out of three different words. Ah, three word point on earth. Yes, this is great. Has anyone seen this? I don't think, know if this took off, but this, the point of this was... Um, what three words? Where are we? English, explore map. Yeah. Yeah, so let's go to, where are we? Burlington, VT. So this crazy thing, what they've done is, as you move around, does it have a thing? Oh, it's at the bottom, right? Yeah, so saves, saves alley.envy. That's a, that is a, a location. This is really weird, right? I don't know why I'm not allowed to, why, why is this not working for me? I'm not sure what is, what am I doing? Look. Lock pin. Oh, okay, that's fine. But it should, it should as you as you move around. I think it's like every three meters, 
it transitions to three new words. So we can make an address for this spot here. That's the idea. And it's memorable. Right? Three words gives you a lot of variation. Uh, why won't this give me... And it wants to. Yeah. So this this is kicks past a steer, and now we're in. I don't know where we are. Um, it should be just a little explorer thing. Oh, I don't want that. Ah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to point out. Yeah, that was not good. Okay. So let's. Yeah. Let's. I know we're running out of time, so um, but this is hilarious. Whoa, we're over. Yeah, so I drag, 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 drag. Yep. Okay. Ha ha. It's pretty funny. Are we sort of where are we? We're kind of here, right? No. There's Fleming, right? Are we in this box? This thing. We're in here. That's us, right? Like there. Yes. Yeah. So it's um. Total spirit sting. <laughs> right? And you move it just a bit and a, a wake raft hips. They're all, I mean, these are all, these are all bags, fruit, hotels. These are also, they're not bizarre words from like, you know, kicked pay of floats. We cover the earth completely with three fairly common words. And they're, and they're not using, they're doing something good where they're not using the very common words. They're going further into the distribution of words, but not too far out. Right? We're not into bizarre chemistry things or something shall lovely keeps. So you could, the idea of this was to like be able to address anything. So if you want to send something somewhere, you could just, you could have it. You're very specific, dwell lamps submit. Anyway, pretty cool. Does the tense matter? Could you have dwell lamps submit and dwell lamps submitted? I think, I, yeah, I think they managed to keep away from, they have plurals. But I don't think they have. Does it let you search for a three word combo? Yeah, I guess so. Spaghetti. Yeah, I see, it's just going to search for that. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> Humans. Okay. Sorry. Keep it. It's still hot, right? Summer hasn't ended. So on Thursday, it's all going to be happy. So, um,. It's a marathon. So uh, maybe words can be encoded this way. That's true too, right? So maybe words can be encoded this way. Interesting thing about is think about, say, Morse code. Is that a, an efficient um, encoding of letters given their frequency of usage? Again, with Scrabble, so, the scra so those numbers for Scrabble come from the guy who invented it took the front of the New York Times and counted up how many times each letter appeared and then used that as a guide for the scores and for how many there should be. Right, so there are more E's than, because there are more E's, right. 1930 or something, yeah. Okay, so here's the idea, um, and this starts to get us to entropy. Uh, so we've got, these are, we'll just imagine our words are these binary sequences, right? So they're ones or zeros, we can send everything with binary. So these are all words, and we're just going up through words in binary, uh, and if we had, this is a, like a two-letter, you can imagine a two-letter alphabet. Um, and so an M-letter alphabet would be like a, um, a base M number system. So we're going up through them. So we'd want to call this one, this would be the and of and an, right? We want to use that for the. And we have another character for space. And this is just the length of them, just exactly, right? There's two characters, three, 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 three. And it's binary, so as when we get to... Um, you know, round whole numbers like this, round, uh, multiples of powers of two, I should say, then the length is very clear. Right? So this is two to the power of um, three is eight, right? This is eight. So two to the power of three is eight. So that power plus one gives you the length. Two to the power of um, uh, two is, um, so two to the power of two is four. And two plus one is this length. To the power of one is two plus one for this length. So that's what this is. So the word length of the two k word is k plus one. And so we can write it as actually it's one plus log two of that number. Right? Log two of two to the power of k 
k can come down as log 2 of 2 is 1. Right? What do you raise 2 to the power to get 2 to the k? Okay. So, uh, for these ones in between, this is not indexing plainly, of course, right? It's always, they've got to be even, they've got to be uh, integers. We could just say, well, it's 1 plus log 2i. That's an estimate of, of the length. Then we have m letters, and in an m letter based system, it'll be log base uh, m. So, this is this simple thing that Mandelbrot argues for. And then, uh, this is the setup. So, we're going to have the cost. It's going to be the cost of the words, right? Each of uh, the ith word has uh, uh, this cost. Again, this is our argument from the previous slide, right? Log m based i. We have m uh, characters in our alphabet. And, uh, right, so we're going to add a space. We can just put a plus one in there. It's not a big deal. Um, the fixed cost for all of them, we can just subtract that off, right? We don't have to worry about that. We're, just, we're interested in the difference between them. And um, we don't, we, we like playing with log e. So log m, log m of a blob equals log e of that blob, and then we divide by log e m. It's a little exercise if you have to to figure that out. Right? So log in some base of a number is equal to log of any other base of that number with a little factor out here, right? They're proportional to each other. So that's good, so we can turn to log e. So our total cost would be this, right? So the total cost would be the probability of the ith word. If you, if you like, this is the average cost, um, which is fine too, so it's the average. That's all right. um, so it's pi, this is probably the ith word appears, and then this cost we've argued for is going to be log of i plus 1, which is an, roughly its length, or related to its length. Fine. So that's not a bad little thing. And again, there are n words, so it's the sum from i equals 1 to n. Um, all right, we'll come back to this later on, but I'll just start this, I'll just show you this page. Uh, what we'll use is Shannon's entropy for the information content. And so this is a wonderful, famous thing. I'm going to maybe fix up some slides for this as well. I mean, it's all here, but I want to add some more. So there's a PI in here, and we'll explain why this might, really it's this minus log 2 PI. That is the... Um, number of bits, it's basically the number of bits you need to encode this word if you did it in the most efficient way, assuming words arrive randomly, right? Which obviously they don't, but this is the average number of bits needed to encode each word. Um, so what this means, this is log, this is pi log one over pi if we put the minus in there. So a very common word, we use a small number of bits. A very rare word, we can use a lot more bits and we do that because we're not going to have to, we're not going to have to, you know, put that code out there much. So we're allowed to sort of just spread the code out, uh, you know, the, the encoding can get bigger for it because it's rarer. Um, it's not exactly how words work, but if you want to transmit something, this is how you would encode things. All right, so I'll talk more about this on Thursday. We'll get there. Um, beautiful things in entropy, uh, lots of applications in ecology, um, you know, the wealth of nations, all sorts of other areas, right? So it's not just about um, words or things like this. All right, thank you. Thank you for the uh, putting up with diversions. And um, on we go.